I now know how to lift heavy things safely and I feel better and stronger when I do it. So that was something that I thought was doing right because I was reading it in books and some of my mentors were telling it to me. It was the conversation at the time. But now that I found a different teacher, I found something different that works for me. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast, where we learn everything we can about playing and coaching beach volleyball. You're always welcome to visit our website, betteratbeach.com, where we have a number of ways for you to get better. We have online training programs of every skill where we can take you step-by-step -step through tutorials, drills, and you can fix your passing, your setting, your arm swing mechanics, your serving, your attacking, your defense, your blocking, whatever it is in beach volleyball, you name it, we want to help you get better at it. If you've ever asked yourself if I'm really doing this right, we invite you to jump into one of those skill courses where we can help players erase bad habits, get more control of the game, and learn high-level strategy and flat-out win more matches. Our most popular online program is our 60-day max vertical jump program, guaranteed to add inches to your vertical leap. If you want to add mobility, strength, speed, and power to your game, we have the answer. We also provide online coaching and mentorship from real professional athletes and coaches. It's perfect for people who want to coach to take their game to the next level. And we would love to see you at one of our seven-day training vacations where you can hang out with pros and get over 40 hours of training and playing at beautiful beach resorts. You can always reach out if you want to bring us to your hometown to run a one-day clinic for your local players or coaches. As always, please support your sport by subscribing to our podcast. Please give us a five-star rating and share this episode with the volleyball players and coaches in your life. My name is Mark Burrick, and we are going to get into it. Today, we're going to talk about nine things from my career and uh, from all of my years in sport, coaching, and playing that I thought I was doing right, but I just wasn't, or at least that I've changed after thinking that I had locked in. And maybe you guys will be able to relate to some of these. Uh, maybe you guys are going through the exact same things where you think that what you're doing is a great way to do it. And I'm just going to provide some extra answers, some paths that I've taken, and really some key things that I've added to my game. If you know that with our guests, uh, with our guests, we always ask, you know, what they're adding to their game right now, what they're currently working on. And I think that's important because as players and coaches, first of all, you want to see your models, role models, and understand that they too are working. We don't, none of us have it right None of us have it perfect, and we're all on a path. And hopefully, uh, you guys can glean some info and insight from uh, my path. So that's what we're going to do today, and we are going to dive right in. Okay. Now, the first little group here that I really want to talk about is going to be attacking. These are all going to be attacking keys. Okay. The very first thing that I want to talk about is the speed of your shots and if you're new to volleyball a shot obviously is a, not obvious but it's a slower softer shot to a location you're just trying to make sure that you hit around the defense instead of blowing them up with a power swing and for some reason early on i was able to see where players were standing so i felt like my shots were pretty good uh, uh, but the problem came with the speed of those swings. And let me dive into that a little bit more. When you have great vision or even good vision, you can see the defense and you understand where they are. And as soon as you know where they are, you probably just say, okay, the point's over. I've, I'm done. I made the right decision. So now all I have to do is get the ball there. When you're shooting, if you see the open location, you think that it's easy to get the ball there. So anything just kind of slows down and you're like, all right, well, they're in the cross, so I can just hit this high line and it's going to be a point. The problem with this mentality is that people get faster and they get faster quick as you go through the levels, as you increase your skill level and play a new level of athlete. So when I was playing in New York and Long Beach, you know, I would see people move very early to one spot or the other. And I would say, ah, okay, I would take this long exhale and I would just uh, hit the ball where they weren't. Then you get into qualifiers. Then you start getting at the, at the AVP level and all of a sudden just the right decision is not enough. 
you have to make the right decision and you have to execute it with speed. So one of the things that I had to change really early was not just hitting the location and thinking that I was right, but as soon as I knew that a location was open or I had made my decision, even if I didn't know, getting on that ball as fast as I could, and I like the word accelerating. I needed to accelerate my shots. And still, sometimes every now and then I'll I'll fall back into it where I hit a slow shot, maybe because of, well, relaxation, uh, or you're not quite certain. So when you guys are shooting, make sure that once you make that decision, you get on the ball as quick as you can. Your shots get to whatever spot they have to get to as quick as they can. That means that your cuts should not be these loopy, arky, spinny things. Your cuts should go down. If you have the physical capability where you can jump high enough, you can get high enough over the net, and you can hit the ball down, that's what the best cut shot is. If you're thinking about a high line, uh, you want to throw darts instead of loops if you can. Again, of course, the blocker is going to get in the way. You still have to get it above the blocker, but you want it to be as fast as possible. So once you make that decision, make sure that you get it there as fast as possible. Okay. So the first thing that I was doing that I thought I was doing right was looking, making that decision, and then relaxing or thinking that the play was over because I was going to hit the right location. Okay. Get on the ball quicker. The second thing, uh, and, and I mentioned that I was pretty good at looking, I guess, early on. The second thing is looking too long. I used to have this and the way I used to coach too, as I said, you know, you should be able to like, at, at some point you're going to get so good at looking that you're going to be able to read the letters on somebody's chest. And the problem with that is you try to hold on to your vision for too long. When you take off that moment when you're coming out of the sand from your jump, to me right now, that's when your decision is over and it needs to be made. Okay. That doesn't mean that you're going to go up, hang, 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 try to keep your the, you know, your peripherals on the defense and then locate. What happens then is everybody knows that you are shooting so they can get ready to run, even if your location is good. Uh, the defense, the defender has also been able to time themselves, which means that they can do like a split stop or they can get just a little bit lower where they know exactly uh, they're setting their feet before you contact. A lot of times if you can hit a little bit quicker, and this goes back to the first key, if you can hit a little bit quicker into your jump, you actually hit the ball before the defense settles their feet, and then they get a late start. But if you're looking too long, first of all, too early, maybe we can start with that. If you're looking too early, you can't track the set. You should be able to see the setter set, get a good read on the ball, and make sure that you can get there. If you're staring at the defense while your setter is setting, you're not going to get your read off the ball. I understand that when you're learning this, it's probably one of those tough things because you're so focused on seeing the other side of the court that you forget even to look at your setter. You forget even to look at the set. But you have to see the setter set, and then when you're about to take off, you need to look. This look should not, the way we teach in our camps and clinics, this look should not be a video. This look should be a snapshot as if you're just taking a quick picture. You need to gather all of your information in that instant. Okay. So instead of staring, 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 looking at somebody and holding, 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 waiting for them to give up their spot and then hitting, you're already on your way down. You're already lower and everybody knows that you're shooting. And even at that moment, you know, your blocker can either take off, they can peel and they're they are really going to catch you if they peel. So looking too long, too early and too long. You can't hold that gaze. Make sure that you're taking a snapshot. It's quick. And in that quick moment, you go with your best information and you do it as quickly as possible. I think that applies to like a lot of, I don't know, maybe business and I'm sure kind of uh, military operations where it's the longer you wait because you're just trying to gather as much information as possible, you often get stuck, you freeze, and other people are making moves before you can. Go with what you think is right in that moment and execute it quickly, okay? Make sure that you're getting on it. So don't look too long. Take a flash and then execute it. Get it to the ground as quick as possible. The next thing I've I've applied 
to my offense in the last couple of years has been getting rid of this idea of going in with an open mind when you're hitting. Okay. That is a little bit of an issue. And I'll tell you why it was an issue for me, and I'll tell you why it immediately increased some of my players' hitting percentages once we applied this. When the 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 people that we battle against are going to be the people that that talk about flow state in a certain way where you get to just you don't have to think everything is perfect everything is going right but that's not exactly the the full nature of flow state flow state is where you're not thinking about outside things that's very different than having a plan and being within your craft or within your skill okay so you can still have a plan a game plan a strategy and be in that flow state where you're performing well. So what I've changed about my offense and what I'm trying to change about the players that I coach, their offense, and this has been super effective in increasing hitting percentage, is not to go in to their swing with this open mind. I don't want to be in the air thinking I have nine different options right now. What is the other team doing? First of all, this is this is reactive instead of proactive. And we're on offense, right? So we should be dictating the play, not waiting to see what the defense does. And then, you know, we, we do something for that. Even in defense, the mindset of defense has changed where you're trying to create things. You're trying to make things happen, not just be reactive. And so if you go into... Every swing with this open mind of you can hit hard cross, you can hit hard line, you can hit high line, you can hit over cross, you can hit over cut, you can hit high seam, you can hit pokey, you can try to chisel it under them. All of a sudden, all of these decisions, they all crash into each other while you're in the air and they cause indecision. There's this marketing study about the dynamics of choice and they put jellies into supermarkets. In one of them, I think they had two jellies. You know, it was like grape or apple, something like that. And in the other supermarket or in the, the other testing group, they put like 27 different jellies, all different flavors. And what they wanted to see was, did people buy and how long it took them to buy? When, you, when shoppers had two choices, they made decisions quicker and they bought more. Supermarkets always thought that if we give people more options, hey, you know, they're going to be able to, to, to get exactly what they want. But instead, you had this paralysis that comes with too many choices. And they not only were they so much slower to purchase the right jelly because there are so many decisions to make, but most of them get so frustrated with making the choice that they just stopped and they didn't buy any of the jellies. Okay, when we translate this, there, there's also, as far as I know, there's done a, a fighter pilot study where they gave them instead of okay, you've got this giant 3D space and now let's just make whatever decision we have to. Instead, they, they gave them a binary checkpoint where it's if-then scenario. So basically you have to answer just a series of yes-no questions. And this also eliminated errors and made decisions faster. So if you, took, if you take those two for volleyball and you say, okay, you know, I have the entire court to work with i have a lot of shots in my arsenal and the defense is doing a lot of stuff you're not going in being proactive you're not going in taking control and asserting your will and then with all of these decisions to make you might end up freezing okay i did a shot chart with one of my players and uh we talked about literally we talked immediately about offensive strategy I said okay what are you trying to do what are you trying to establish here what's your best swing and he told me you know uh, it was his cut shot. So, okay. I watched him play a game to 15. And I said, do you know how many of each swing you had in one game to 15? And he had no idea. He didn't have an answer. I said, okay, well, you told me that your cut shot was your best swing, right? How many times did you use that? And he said, two. And I said, one. In one set to 15, which is the most important, he had one cut shot. But more importantly, he literally hit eight other shots eight other attempts at swinging. So this showed me that he was not going in with an offensive strategy. He wasn't trying to establish anything. He was just making stuff up and, and hoping it would go, but he had a lot of errors.
So in the next match, I said, you're allowed to hit two balls. That's it. You know, cut shot or high line. And if they peel, you still have to go high line. Okay. So cut shot or high line, that's it. I'm not saying that this is for everybody. What I am saying is experiment with it and see if you immediately decrease errors. Of course, you're going to have to take stats to do this. His hitting percentage went up 20 points just in that, like that one next set because he was able to focus. You know, he had two shots that he had to worry about. Hit that cut shot, hit that high line. It wasn't, oh, well, what if they peel? Um, well, maybe I should hit hard cross. He's going to jump in front of me and he's going he's gonna to block. No, you're being reactive at that point. So for me, I used to go in with that open mindset. And I said, you know what? I'm going to through my if-then shot. I'm going to have a binary choice here. So when I applied that a couple of years ago, my offense as well, statistically, this isn't subjective. It immediately went up. I chose a swing each point, And I said, this is the swing that I'm going to hit. Then I have an unless. Okay. Normally, if somebody's going to stop, you know, your favorite swing, there's a, a singular way to stop it usually. So I would say, if I see them do this, then my next swing is this. So I had a plan A and I had a plan B. I didn't go for one swing and then if it's closed, I don't have a plan after that. Okay. And then you have your oh crap shot, which I'm telling you right now for everybody, it should be deep middle. When you're in trouble, just hit deep middle. You will be shot. It's going to be, you're going to think it's stupid how many points you get by hitting deep middle when you're in trouble or even if you're in system. So this binary check down system for offense improved mine. It improves our players. It eliminates errors and it makes you able to make a decision faster and it helps you dictate your offense. You are the dictator at that point instead of being reactive to what the other team is doing. Okay. You don't need to use the same A swing every time. You don't have to. Okay. But each point you should have in mind, what are you trying to establish if this happens? And you can dive into that further. You can make a bunch of rules for yourself, but you should have a plan, an offensive plan, an offensive strategy. And I don't think most people do that. At the B, A, double A level, I think people just bump set hit with no regard for establishing the long game. So I would say uh, having that open mind when you're going into offense, you should try to get rid of it. See what it feels like. See if it helps you eliminate errors. See if it makes it simpler. The problem is sticking to this. It's sticking to it when you think that you're on the right strategy and you get stopped once or twice. I'm telling you right now that a strategy works over time. It works statistically which means you're going to lose a few points down the road. And that doesn't mean that you've chosen the wrong strategy. And it doesn't even mean that you should change that strategy. Okay, Stick to it, see it out over the course of a set, two sets, a tournament, and see if it works for you. We've got tournaments coming up and you've got practices. You can use one practice to practice hitting high lines and cut shots only because that practice will make you excellent at hitting those shots from more locations and hitting them better when you need to. Okay. So don't go in with an open mind for a little bit. I want you to see if you can establish one swing, have an A shot, have a B shot, and then have your oh crap shot, your C shot. All right. We're still on attacking for our nine tips here. So the next thing that I taught for a while, and I'm going to blame April Ross, <laughs> was the stomp approach. Uh, when you see April Ross approach, you kind of see her knees like almost gallop and it looks like she's jumping up, then hitting the ground hard with these like slappy two feet instead of kind of cruising into an approach. Now, you know, she's been a highlight player for, I guess, a decade and a half now. And so we get to see a lot of her. So you're like, all right, well, she's in the finals and she's got this approach. The majority of the players do not have the stomp approach. Okay, so we're going to look at some excellent people a lot. But we also want to look at, see if that actually applies, you know, scientifically in terms of physics. Does it help you? A lot of people when they're going right, left, right, left in their approach from their left to their right, left, they end up hopping up and then slapping their last two feet and then jumping up again. This jump up or like puddle stomp, it creates a big delay mid air. So between your left and your step close, if you go all the way up and then you stomp your feet, 
you don't have control of your timing anymore while you're in the air. So you're sacrificing some control, some ability to time the ball by using that. Okay. Also, when a lot of people hop up, the problem is when they jump up, they land on straight legs and then they bend them again and then they go up. So this causes timing and force reduction. If you're going to do the stomp approach, uh, approach properly, you need to hit the sand. When your feet hit the sand, they should already be at a 90 degree bend. So you take all of that force and you stomp it into the sand and then you get it out. But if you're doing this, the problem is you're going to waste, like you're going to spend a lot of kind of downward energy. And too many people use that going up, then down and then up. So it's very difficult for people to embrace that, you know, hitting the ground with a 90 degree knee bend so that they can then jump a little bit higher. Instead, let's cruise along the ground. Let's stay low through our approach. Keep your feet on the ground more. You know, that last little burst, instead of going up, go forward. The more you go forward into the ball, the more ability you have to see the court, the more you keep the ball and the defense in front of you. If you do the stomp approach, a lot of times you kind of almost do that in place. And if you're doing that in place, it means you're not moving forward, which means the ball is above you instead of in front of you. And you end up losing vision because now you have to look up. And when you have to look up, it's very difficult to see what's right in front of you. So you lose track of the blocker, you lose track of the defense. Okay. I don't think the stomp approach is for most people. I used to teach it biomechanically and in terms of timing it started started realizing that it became incorrect. So now I like to cruise low and I teach the players cruise low, keep your feet on the ground. When you go from your left to your right left, you're still going to sink pretty low. I don't want their bodies to go up into the air and them to lose that timing. Okay. Stay low, cruise through it. And for the majority of people, try to get rid of that stomp approach in most situations. Okay. I, I think it'll serve your vision just a little bit better. Now let's move on to a little bit of defense before we talk about some intangibles like partner stuff, as well as lifting. When we talk about serving tough, what does that mean to you? Serving tough does not automatically mean serving harder, serving faster, more powerfully. Serving tough can be serving harder you know, with more velocity, but it, it also means choosing locations over time. You see where the people are on the court. And for some reason, we're just, the ball becomes a magnet out of our hands and it goes straight to somebody's chest. You know, and we can't have that. Serving tough can be serving sidelines. It can be serving short all day long. It can be serving those high rainbow deep serves all day long. All of these causes a lot of footwork that beginner and intermediate players don't always pay attention to, how you can change somebody's footwork and actually knock them off balance. But when you serve short, most players don't get back to half court and they don't get the full approach that they normally do. This doesn't only affect their power and ability to jump, but it affects their vision too. When you serve somebody high and deep, now they have a long pass, which means their setter is probably going to get a little bit more nervous because they're setting a longer, higher ball. And they end up carrying their momentum. Usually when you put somebody deep, instead of getting to their three quarters depth where they should start their approach from and then starting their approach, they end up running straight from that back line and they then lose total control of their timing. You can also serve sidelines. You can knock them inside, knock them outside, put them some way, find some way to get them off of their line. Now, that's what I thought serving tough meant. We have to be aggressive. We have to serve tough. It doesn't just mean bring heat. And I'll tell you <laughs> what happened next as the next evolution. Once I realized that serving tough didn't automatically mean bringing more velocity, I got so in tuned with the strategy side of it that I would just kind of rely on hitting those spots. And I never went back to bringing the heat, right? Let's, let's talk about it in terms of Major League Baseball, maybe with pitchers. Pitchers have a hard core fastball, something that they just let go of, right? So that you're putting heat on it and you're attempting that location. But then you also have those change up serves that are designed to get somebody off balance, designed to change their timing. Um, sorry, off speed pitches, a curveball, a knuckleball, a change up, right? Those jack up the timing. But those are usually only effective if you can apply different pressures at different times. So if you keep throwing curveballs, you keep throwing changeups, 
and you never get in there with a fastball you're not going to affect the player the way it's designed the way they're designed to be effective so what i did is uh, once i found about found out about all those spots and that they changed people's timings and knocked them off balance that became the thing that uh, i became obsessed with now i'm back to a place where there is a time to rip and <laughs> there's a time to as some of my east coast buddies say whip it out and show them what you're made of and then there's also a time to find strategy right and see what's going what's going to work in terms of spots now ideally you can spot people and hit with heat but if you have the type of serve where you can overpower people don't lose that i think i ended up losing that for you know maybe a year maybe two and now i'm back to a point where i can get back there and i could say no it's time to physically take over instead of mentally taking over so i think you guys can embrace that there's a time to be physical and strong and aggressive and that will turn and win a match. But there is also a time to knock people off balance and be very strategic about the spots that you serve. And of course, ideally, you know, you want to be able to do both. Okay. So serving tough, I thought I had it right. Then I changed and I thought I had it right again. And now I'm at a place where I think I have it right again. But you can explore all of those spots, heat, changing up and knowing when it's time to physically push the match. Okay. Or, you know, vice versa, if you're hitting too hard and you're hitting too many serves and you're consistently throwing the same 85 mile an hour fastball, somebody's eventually just going to hit that, hit that out of the park. We talked about that in Panama where it was so windy and everybody kept trying to bring as much heat as they could, but everybody was passing nails and maybe the tournament would have been better served or players would have been better served if a lot more people changed it up with some float serves and let the wind dance up with the ball. So just because it was windy, and there's wind in your face doesn't automatically mean that you should go to that power serve change it up keep the other team off balance next on my list is still a defense one for something i thought i was doing right and we train this a lot when we were training back in the east coast chris frazier shane donahue brandon joiner eric lucas hudson bates zon and dentler and we were practicing i remember specifically because i think i have a picture or i found a video of it later on but we were practicing fours right? Running when the blocker dives into the diagonal and the defender runs to the line. The way we ran it was that I kept trying to leave early enough so that I could dig the hard driven down the line. I thought that the four was designed to dig everything except for maybe the overcross. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. I think people get upset when they run a four when they dive their blocker into the diagonal and they run their defender late to line and then the attacker hits hard line. That's not the time to be upset because normally the four is not designed to dig the hard driven line ball. That is one of the swings that you give up. So if you're trying to leave so early that you're actually able to dig the hard driven line. Most likely you've left too early and you're going to give your spot away to the offense. So when you're using that four for a little while for this week, whenever you're listening to it, if you've been under this mentality, don't worry about digging the hard driven line. And if they hit that, clap your hands together and say like, yeah, all right, nice job. That was one of the two swings that could have won against this defense and they chose correctly and there's always a swing that wins against a certain defense right that is something very important to remember that you can't just keep getting pissed off every time you lose a point the offense is supposed to win in beach volleyball so if they have control you're trying to move them around you're trying to dictate a little bit of what they do and the decisions they make as a defender but if you see professionals the way that professional players react and the way that kind of intermediate players react to losing points i think you see intermediate players getting pretty upset after every point that they lose and a professional is so relaxed after they lose two or three points in a row because they know what they're giving up they know what their long-term strategy is and they know that they're really only trying to get one out of every you know eight plays they're trying to get one dig every eight plays to to be at the top of the AVP in terms of digs. So just keep that in mind that when you're running a four, you're not supposed to dig the hard driven line. And if you just want to apply that to the rest of, of everything, uh, of your defense, just know that each defense isn't really supposed to dig everything. So don't get so upset every time you lose a point. Remember, that's a long-term strategy. Even if you're blocking line and you're defending cross, tell yourself, I'm digging the hard driven cross and a cut shot right now. And then in the next play, you could say, I'm digging hard driven cross 
and the line shot right now. You know, if you find those zones, you'll be more comfortable and you'll be easier on yourself when you give up a certain swing or you don't quite get to a certain swing. That doesn't mean give up on it. It just means that if they hit it so good and you still can't get to it, that's one that you're okay with. You're still responsible for all the sloppy shots, the ones that they miss hit and can't, and it just looks ugly and slow. Those you still got to eat up. Okay. So on the fours, or let's just call it on, on all defense, you're not supposed to dig every swing choose what two swings you're getting choose that's why you're designing an offense to stop probably two swings and uh, you should be good from there i've got three more for you guys that i thought i was doing right this one is big and i see it <laughs> a lot with logan logan weber practicing too much training you know i even carry this into the small business like now we're doing podcasting we're doing youtube videos i still work too hard honestly but practicing too much instead of looking at what you can be doing to maximize each practice, to maximize your conversation, maximize your strategy, and understand that if you just keep practicing without directing it, without saying what you're improving on, without setting a goal for that month, measuring it, and saying, hmm, did it work? If you're not doing all of these things, then you're just fatiguing yourself because you might get a little bit crispier. But you know, if you just keep playing matches and you never actually figure out how to improve your high line, the the small little hand adjustments, feeling and understanding your swing once you jump up into the air, if you can't understand those so that you're training specific goals then you're just shooting in the dark really and you're exhausting yourself you know i i practiced for way too many hours and i would train as well in the gym literally when i was pro overseas i, I had a lot of just six hour days the notion of recovery never entered my head and i didn't often set goals all i wanted to do was just get stronger get better, get stronger, instead of dicing it up, you know, you know making sure that I'm going into a, a small skill mindset where I'm going to improve one thing at a time, or I'm going to improve one number at a time, and then devising a way to do that. So if you're out there, and I feel like these athletes are rare, but if you're the person who is just going ham, see if you can find a coach who can give you some direction so that you're practices can be focused save yourself some time save yourself some injury save yourself yes yeah, save yourself some injury potential and direct your energy a little bit better and a coach a mentor will be able to do that and you have to choose each month what are you going to get better at this month then you need to ask how are you going to do it what drills are going to make you better at it and how long you're going to do those okay and you have to measure those with uh, your gameplay as well because you need game experience but you can't just keep practicing as hard as you can as long as you can okay so that was a mistake i made i thought that i didn't have a notion of recovery i practiced and played too much without having a very specific direction and without giving any credence to the recovery nature of it don't practice too much but instead i would say direct your practices instead of just playing. Last two we got. This one comes from relationships with partners. I've put a lot of pressure on my partners and my teammates for a long time since I can remember. I mean, high school football, I they gave me the captainship my JV year. And during warm-ups, you know, I thought they were giving us we had to do crunches as part of our warm-up routine to get stronger, to get fitter. And Instead, it was, it was more designed just to warm up to kind of increase your base just a little bit. So I would just go until the coaches told me to stop. And I would make my whole team do 50, 75, 100 crunches just during warm up. And people like thought I was crazy, thought I was nuts. And I would just keep going harder and harder and harder. And I had a very high and still do have a very high expectation of my partners. And that puts a lot of pressure. When you show up to practice and you think that somebody is going to hold you to this incredibly high standard for hustle you just have to know i'm not going to tell you not to do it but you just have to know what it's going to do to people and not everybody can handle that high amount of pressure every single day or thinking that their teammate constantly thinks that they're not doing enough i took a look at guys like casey jennings who looked to be like a maniac you know <laughs> When he was playing on the court, like sometimes he would just get in the face of his partner and tell him what to do. And, you know, I, I saw it in a couple other players as well, like Adrian Carambula, who became you know, a, a world sensation, put a lot of pressure on his partners. And you could see it and you could feel it. And it was tense. These guys are both great players, but I see a lot of not great players as well who just 
constantly make their partners feel like whatever they're doing is not enough. You have to find an agreement with your partner. You have to understand where they're at. And all you have to do is you have to understand that consciously, this has to be a conscious choice, putting pressure on your player and understanding that with that conscious choice, it's going to affect them in a certain way. They're going to react in a certain way. And especially since it's beach volleyball and it's two on two, you have one partner. They'll go somewhere else, you know? So if you if you don't have that solid long-term relationship, they will go somewhere else. For indoor, when I was playing college, I put that same pressure on people, but they had some of the other guys on the team to lean against and to keep them happy and joyful and staying on the team. I think that was important for them. If it was a team full of me and Hudson, where we kept putting tons of pressure on everybody at every instant in the weight room on the practice court, it would have been a different story. But because we had such a good team, we were well-rounded. People had other people to go to, to lean on. In beach volleyball, there's one other person. And if you're going to make that decision to hold each other to an incredibly high standard and not hold back on your feedback or not even guard it, with your words, you know, or say it in a softer, nicer, con- kinder way, there's a good chance that that partner will leave. They just won't want to play with you and, and they'll shut down. So just know that when you put that pressure, it's not inherently a bad thing. You just have to understand what it has the potential to do to your relationship, to the partnership. Okay. And then make choices from there. See if every time you do put that pressure, see if it actually works. Ask them, hey, do you want to get fired up? Do you want me to be tough on you? If they're just like, nah, man, I, I just need you next to me. Okay, then then that's that's what we'll do. But you, you have to understand that that level of pressure will knock out 99% of humans. It, people don't want to experience that or feel that all of the time. Okay, it's a lot of emotional strain to be able to tolerate and it takes a very a very special person to to walk into the same situation day after day in a tense environment that is something that i've been trying to change in my game put a little bit less pressure and i'm not saying don't hold standards but react in a different way to to hold on to some partners a little bit better the last and i didn't save the best for last or anything but my last tip is bracing while lifting i was talking to a good friend a physical therapist about this when i was coming up as a personal trainer and a performance enhancement specialist they told me to to brace my core by sucking in my belly button and kind of getting tall and keeping my belly button close to my spine and they said that that was core engagement it, it didn't it never kind of made sense to me that I, you know, would like keep my belly button sucked in and then keep trying to breathe while doing this. And I understand that this engages some of the paraspinals, but when you're lifting, it just always created instability. And I think because there was so much instability that might have ended up in in a lot of injuries for me. Recently, I went back to Olympic lifting and powerlifting and I started studying. Some players signed up for some online programs, not players, lifters. I signed up for some online programs and reintroduce myself bracing, but in a way that the Olympic lifters do it and in a way that pure strength athletes do it and everything. When you have those belts, when you have those big lifting belts, every one of those athletes creates internal pressure by expanding their diaphragm, like opening up from the sides and creating this big and then pressing out on it, creating a ton of internal pressure from that cavity. Almost like if you were to push your stomach out and tighten it, so that you had the ability to punch yourself a bunch of times, create that type of tension. This is how Olympic lifters brace themselves. When I changed away from the whole sucking my belly button in thing to pressing out from the inside of my stomach and, you know, like using real air and real pressure from my diaphragm and pelvic floor to actually push my belly out and press it against the weight belt and then learn how to do it without a weight belt. I'll tell you what happened. My squat numbers went instantly up just from how I changed my stomach, how I changed my bracing around my core, being able to create that internal pressure so that you could push your belly button out and create force from inside. What that does essentially is when you put all of the pressure um, uh, in your mid, once you have all of that pressure, the fluid and the space in between, it creates a little bit more rigidity. First of all, it creates rigidity so that you have even space between like your ribs and your hips and they don't wobble so that that extra pressure out there goes. And then once that external, the external core muscles are rigid, that helps the spine stay rigid. And then you don't have any wobble and you don't have any of these energy leaks. When I fix the way that I brace 
in terms of lifting, it was an immediate, and I'm not talking about like a week or a couple lifts later. I'm, I'm telling you that I was able to lift instantly more because of how I held my core muscles. And originally when I was coming, I don't know in the industry why they told us to try to bring our belly button close to our spine. And I'd like to have more conversations with more people like that. But then when I went and I, I said, you know what, I'm going to study some Olympic level Olympic lifters. None of them were doing that and none of them recommended it. And they all recommend the bracing, so pressing out from your insides. And I said, all right, I'm going to try this. And as soon as I started lifting like that, strength numbers went instantly up. I got stronger. I now know how to lift heavy things safely and I feel better and stronger when I do it. So that was something that I thought was doing right because I was reading it in books and some of my mentors were telling it to me. It was the conversation at the time. But now that I found a different teacher, I found something different that works for me. So hope that can help you just bracing properly. And that's all nine, guys. That's all nine of the things. I'm sure I've done a lot more wrong, but that's nine of the things that I thought that I was doing right that I've since changed. And I do have a few announcements just before we go. Just so you guys know, June 1st is the sign-up deadline. We have our attacking masterclass at betteratbeach.com. Right now it's on the homepage. You can see all you need to see about it. But essentially, we're going to take you from the ground up. Okay, and I can actually take you through the modules right now. And I'll tell you what's included in this attacking masterclass. It's going to be a month and it might go a little bit longer because what we do in our online courses is we have all of our videos recorded. We take you step by step. We give you video homework so that you can watch it, so that you can actually do it. And then we give you drill homework. When you go and you do your drill homework, you film it. You post it on our private Facebook group. We have a team of coaches that goes in there and actually tells you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Not only do we have literally thousands of hours invested into the videos that we've created in this in these courses, but for the attacking masterclass specifically, which is starting on June 1st, you have to sign up before June 1st if you want to go through the whole thing. You're getting access to that course and you're getting access to all of our skill courses. Now, we're not going to talk about all the other skill courses, but you have access to them, right? And you have access to the 60 day max vertical program. Once you're in here, you're going to watch a few videos each week and you're going to get video homework. When you do the video homework, you post it on the Facebook group. And like I said, we actively coach you. So when most people talk about online courses and they go through a recorded version and you can do that and you can crush this. I mean, building your technique from the ground up so that your steps are right, your jump mechanics are right. Most people, the large majority of people actually legitimately have no idea how to jump in terms of, in terms of mechanics, in terms of sinking their arms. And so one of the first things that we do is we make sure that you get the right footwork so that you can be consistent and you fix your jump mechanics so that you can actually utilize whatever strength or power you have. That's just the first module. After that, let's see, I'm going to go through the modules here. So footwork is the first fo first module. Then the second, we're going through elite jump mechanics. After that, we talk about arm swing mechanics for power, how to develop actual power, how to develop torque through your body and what that actually means, how to create whip. And if you have shoulder injury or pain, I'm telling you right now, this course, I, I can't promise that it's going to eliminate it. But when so many players say, hey, as soon as I made those fixes, I was able to hit harder and I was completely out of pain and I haven't been able to swing at a ball without pain in years. And all we had to do was give them a few technical cues to fix their arm swing. And that was it. And when we can see you swinging because you're posting your videos on the Facebook group, we can give you real advice and, and give you help. The fourth module is timing and spacing, understanding exactly where you need to be and when you need to start and how to adjust your timing. There's a lot of different spacing scenarios that you need to understand from right side, from left side, when the pass is tight, when the pass is off, and where you need to get your ball. And we talk about that a lot in that part. The next one we do, we go through strategy. Okay? Should you use power? Should you use finesse? Who should you model yourself after? How to learn what your best attack is? And then admitting your weaknesses, honestly. We go through a lot of that and we have deep conversations about saying, hey, what should what swings should you really be going for? Because we know what swings Phil Dahlhauser can go for. And I know that you watch him every weekend, but should you play? Should you model yourself like him? Probably not. So let's find a different model for you. And we talk a lot about that in the strategy session as well. 
Then we have vision and decision making, where we train you on how to look, how to see, when to make certain decisions, and again, keeping a survey of the court so that you know what looking entails. And then we give you all the at-home drills that you can do to increase your vision. We talk about out of system offense, what to do when everything is bad and when it's really windy. So we dedicate one, a full module just to, just to out of system, uncomfortable offense when things don't go right. And then we kind of wrap it up with exercises and workouts that are going to make you better at offense. They're going to help you jump higher. What types of exercises you should always be incorporating is so that you can actually hit with power because you can learn how to hit with power, but you can also increase your power potential. So we teach you what exercises and workouts you should be doing as well as we give you a collection of offensive and side out drills. All of this is just in this one course. When you sign up, you get access to all of our courses and our group goes, so we take all of our players, all of our members, and we go step by step through the season. So right now, currently, our members are in their second week of the how to set better in 30 days, the setting blueprint. They're going through all of the setting exercises and they have daily exercises that they can do with hand rhythm, um, essentially bumping, bumping to themselves, hand setting to themselves, and they're recording that and they're also getting coached on that. So if you sign up right now, you can catch the tail end of the setting course so that you can really shore up your hands and understand what setting rhythm looks like. And then you'll be in time for the June 1st deadline for the attacking masterclass, which is going to go so in depth into technique and strategy. So if you've ever felt like you just can't get your timing right, like you don't understand why your consistency is not there, you know, you get one great hit every eight balls, but you don't know what led to it or why, or you're the type of person that gets that one great hit and you're like, yeah, that was the set. It's not usually about the set. <laughs> A set can ruin your hit, but it's about your footwork. It's about establishing consistency so that you can have a great offense. So if you guys want to come along this journey for the attacking masterclass, it's a behemoth. It's awesome. You get real coaching. You get access to all the recordings. And then as soon as we are done with that, we're going to go into our ultimate defender. So you can sign up now. And then before the season, we can take you through all of the offensive techniques and strategies. And then for the next month. Once we're done with that course, we're going into ultimate defender, which is going to be the exact same thing for everything defense. And again, I think the best part about this is that you actually get to post your videos and ask questions in our private Facebook group any time you want. And our coaches respond and give our critique within 24 hours. So when you're kind of wondering, or you're sitting there and you're searching through YouTube and you're like, ah, you know, where's the answer to this unique question that I have about like how to contact my hand on a cut shot or uh, when I should even hit a cut shot. You don't have to wait anymore. You sign up for the program. You put that question in the Facebook group and either a national champion or a professional athlete or a national team coach. Those are the only people we have coaching in there. Those are the ones who are going to give you the answer to all of those questions. Can't recommend this enough, guys. Uh, I built it because I wanted it there for players like me who were looking for answers early on and had this kind of slow discovery process and couldn't quite get the answers, couldn't find a place to get the answer. So we have it for you. We have it built step by step so that you can build your approach and your tack from the ground up. And we hold your hand through it with fantastic coaches. Don't know of any other program like this. I think it is the answer for so many people and it will get you an entirely new offensive set so that you can finally start hitting balls consistently, understanding timing, setting yourself up in the right place so that before you even hit the ball, you have a better chance of getting a great hit just because of the setup in the offensive design, which we go through uh, in the first half of that course. So I really invite you to come along for that journey. Again, it starts June 1st for the tacking masterclass. If you sign up right now, you will also get the last three weeks of the setting course where we're doing all of the setting drills and we're giving that exact same feedback. So if you're, if you're iffy on hand setting in any way, or you're kind of intimidated by it, or you just choose not to, I really think you should get into the course right now. Because again, when you sign up, you get all of our courses and our 60 day vertical jump program 
and 53 fully designed practice plans all together in one membership. The only thing that happens is that we go through as a group one course at a time. If you don't want to follow along with the group and you want to take one of the other courses, because like right now we're doing setting, then we're doing attacking. If you're only interested in defense, you can go through that course. You can still post your videos and we will still answer your questions in the private Facebook group. So I wanted to make sure you guys knew about that. The deadline is June 1st, but if I had the choice, I would get in right now. If I could fix my setting, if I could have somebody lead me for this inexpensive of a price if I could have somebody just lead me through setting and through my game and through my strategy and I had constant access to them getting it there's no doubt in my mind that I would sign up for this it's in a little crazy the price that we're offering right now and me and Chad talk about it every day we have to increase it because it's not going to actually sustain our company at the price that it's at right now so I want you to go to the homepage, go to betteratpeach.com sign up right now it's $39 a month for unlimited coaching and access to what we've put in thousands of hours of work into our videos. And inside of that, I think there is close to maybe 1200 hours of video, but don't worry, I know that sounds intimidating, but we've structured it so that you can actually take it step by step and you have these modules by module, okay? So again, just to like do a little quick rundown, the modules that we go through are the approach, your footwork for attacking, then we go through elite jump mechanics. We teach you how to jump, how to sink your arms. Then we go into arm swing mechanics for power. We get into timing and spacing so that you're in the better location to develop your offense. We go into strategy so that you know what to hit and when to hit it. Then we go into out of system offense and how everything changes once you have a bad pass or once it gets crazy windy. And we have exercises and workouts that are gonna make you a better hitter, plus all of the offensive drills that you should be incorporating into your practice. That's just the offensive course. Then phew, there's a ton of modules for all of the other courses, which you get all in the same package. So go to betterpeach.com right now if you're listening to it. It is the attacking masterclass that will start June 1st. Really looking forward to working with you if you think that this is up your alley. And if not, then keep enjoying our free podcast and then taking a look at our YouTube videos. And if you enjoyed this, go to our, please go to our podcast and subscribe we have a podcast where we have i think 16 episodes up already and it will help us i don't know how yet but subscribers and followers and shares for, for growing our podcast it's just going to grow our audience and let us help more players and help more coaches so go ahead and subscribe to the better at beach volleyball podcast i think it's on google spotify and apple podcasts and that's it uh, if you guys are hanging out and you are on youtube or facebook i have you on live stream and if you ask any question i'll be able to see it and i'm happy to answer any questions Rocky Life said, is there any reason you aren't playing in Austin? I qualified for Austin. We did pretty well in Panama. I went hiking in Hawaii. I fell out of a tree. And it fall out of a tree. The tree broke underneath me and landed on a rock and I now have a broken foot. So that is why I am not playing in Austin. Unlikely for San Antonio, which is the event that leads to New Orleans. So I'll be starting this season three tournaments late, maybe. Sucks. I'm not happy about it, but it is what it is. Joshua, for the next passing masterclass, I want you to remember that as a group, Josh, because you're talking about the passing masterclass, as a group, we move along in one flow. So we're going to get back into passing, I think, uh, at the end of summer and in the fall. But when you sign up for the whole package, you get that entire course. It's just recorded. And the only difference is that the conversation in the private Facebook group, you won't see everybody else posting about passing questions. So you can still post your, your passing questions. So if you want to take the passing masterclass right now, sign up at the exact same place, right? It's still sign up at the exact same place. You still get access to that and you can still post your videos. So if you want to take the passing masterclass, the setting masterclass, fix your arm swing, the ultimate defender, 60 day max vertical, you can do all of that currently right now. And you just sign up in the exact same place. It's all under one membership. So it's still, even if you sign up on the homepage that says the attacking masterclass right now, you get access to all of those courses and you can dive into whichever one you want. Josh, I hope that's clear. It's not always clear in our marketing or our sales pages or anything like that. And I know that, but we focus as a group on one thing at a time. And so that's what the conversation 
will be. And so you'll see a lot more people getting feedback. Like right now, you'll see a ton of people getting feedback on setting. So you'll actually be able to learn a lot about setting, not just from your questions, but when other people post their videos and we go in and we help them, you'll actually be able to, you know, get a really deep understanding of setting and how it looks when different people set and different feedback that we need to give different athletes. So I think you just learn it in a deeper way. But if you don't want to take the setting course right now, if you want to dive straight into the passing class, which we actually just wrapped up, go in, take the course, scroll down on the Facebook group, and you'll see a ton of passing feedback from lots of athletes. And as soon as you do the drills in the course and you post them, we're still going to coach you the exact same way that we're coaching our hitting class. So yeah, hope that's clear. Sounds like you got it. All right. Uh, Krabby Patty, one tip for the approach for your attack. Krabby Patty, I, I gave a bunch of tips today. I would say just follow my Instagram and follow the Better at Beach Volleyball Instagram right now because there are a lot of attacking clips and reels that we are posting. So you don't just need one. Follow us on Instagram, Better at Beach Volleyball, or follow me, Mark Burrick, and you will get a ton of small tips uh, just from that. Colby, at what skill level should you start developing a consistent flow state with your players? All of them. You know, that's something that you get into right away. Remember, flow state is just uninterrupted and, and, and a clean focus on the activity that you're doing. So when a kid, when a five-year-old kid is invested in it, into a, a video game. He's in flow state. You know how like sometimes you'll call your kids to dinner and they won't respond because they're so invested in, in that thing and they go, ah, you're like, no, dinner. And they go, ah. That's not a response because they're so invested. Their mind is, is, is essentially controlled and invested in that video game. So they are in flow state at that point, right? When something is, when somebody is so focused that outside thoughts and outside inputs don't actually affect them, deeply, that person is in flow state. So we practice it all the time. I think adults really struggle to stay in flow state. Like if I'm on my computer and then my phone rings, or if I'm like writing something that I need to write, and then I hear a beep or somebody walks into the room, I haven't been able to enter flow state. And that those distractions that don't allow you to get rolling, they can be dangerous. They can be time sucks and they make you really inefficient. And it's, it's really important for you to try to find some space where you can just do whatever activity you need to do without any outside input or distractions for as, as long as you can. And somebody who has four completely focused and uninterrupted hours every day is 10 times more dangerous than somebody who has eight hours with a boatload of distractions. Thanks for your question. Rocky, how do you get stubborn partners and training group players to reevaluate their technique and do things the right way? You know, you can lead a horse to water. Rocky, like to look at your whole group and say, hey, you're all doing it wrong. It's tough when it comes from one person who's kind of equal. I think the best way is, is again, leading them to water. So if you want them to look at their technique, constantly share little videos, go into our Instagram and just Keep sending or posting the technique videos that we give. Send them the YouTube videos that we have or send them our course so that they can actually fix it so we can help them <laughs> get their game to another level. But to, to look at a giant group and say, you all need to reevaluate how you're past. You're all doing it wrong. Eh, that's not going to be received well. So there's got to be a better way to do it. And one good way is bringing in a coach or an outside authority. And if you want to bring us, for a clinic, that would be where it would happen, where we kind of make people, we help people who have gone on the wrong road for wrong road for too long. We help them get back on the right road in terms of technique and strategy and, and game design. Neil, hey Mark, any tips for learning a new serve when you are learning on your own? I end up spending 90% of my time chasing the ball across the beach and not making much progress. Neil, I would say number one, invest in one of those big golf nets. If you have a beach, maybe there are some garbage cans or something tall that you could stand. I know that on Amazon, you could find like pitcher and golf nets that you can probably get for less than a hundred bucks. And they're super light. You could bring them in like a shoulder bag. And then you could set those up on your court. If you got one ball in one court, you could set those up. And that way you don't have to keep chasing it down. So if you're learning serve on your own, try to rep it out against a wall. If you have a, a wall or if you want to do it on the sand and on the beach and see if it's actually going in the court, then buy one of those 
I don't know, 50, 60 or, uh, Amazon nets. And if you want to help us out, just go to better at forward slash shop and just click to our Amazon store and then go find it. It'll give us like a one or 2% kickback from Amazon and it'll be a little bit of support for us, but that would, that's what I would recommend. If you're serving on your own, try to set up a cheap little net to catch everything or get another friend who plays volleyball. <laughs> all right guys uh that is it from me thanks for listening i hope some of what i said or some of what we consistently say helps you out and gets you to enjoy the game more and i hope that some of it crosses those boundaries where you can actually apply it to your lives or your businesses and and your relationships that's that's becoming a lot more at the forefront of my head so i appreciate you sticking around and I hope you can apply this stuff, like I said, to your games, to your lives and wherever it's important for you. All right. June 1st, sign up deadline for the attacking masterclass. But if you get in there now, you still get three weeks of really focused setting work. And of course you get access as soon as you sign up for any one of our courses, you get access to all of them and our max vertical program, which will help you jump higher and help you jump higher (laughs) you're probably most of you're probably going to add like six inches as long as you dedicate yourself to it and the 53 practice plans which really come in handy so invite you over there hope you guys sign up and then we can get to work and crush the season together all right guys have a good one